Yo, 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 what's up? It's your boy, Coach Myers, and this is the Wrestling Strength Podcast, brought to you by Max Effort Muscle. For all your supplement needs, go to MaxEffortMuscle.com. And we are live here at the Max Effort Muscle HQ, and I got a very special guest today. Now, I know I could probably say this is a man who needs no introduction, but since this is a show, I should probably introduce him, right? So my guy, Colin Moore four-time All-American for The Ohio State University, three-time Big Ten champ, multiple-time world medalist, you know, at the uh, junior U23 level, and most recently, Olympic alternate and world team trials alternate. Colin, what's up, man? Not much. Feeling good. Feeling good? Yeah. All right, well, listen, while we're on the subject, why don't we talk? Let's just, let's just come right out of the gate with a banger. Let's talk let's about the world team trials. We're only a couple of weeks removed from it. Kind of give me your general uh, general thoughts on it. Yeah, it was a good tournament. I felt like, um, you know, I was as prepared as I had ever been, you know. Um, and then first match, pretty pretty quick match, 10-0 tech. Um, That's what we like to see. Yeah. Quick ones. Those, right were, those are gate. what you want. Um, but it was, yeah, I guess I should also start with my first time down at 92 kilos, uh, which is like 203. Um, this is the first time I've weighed that much in close to like a year and a half since I was in college. Well, you think our entire focus since you graduated was to turn you into a legit 97 kilo guy. Yeah. You know, so then it was like, all right, you know, we were this close to the Olympic trials. So then you had to kind of back back down for the world trials. All right. So you're down to 203. Yeah. So that, that was, uh, cutting weight again was interesting but not not too difficult so i i didn't feel like that really played any factor into my wrestling but then uh second match i had hidley um that was an interesting match it looked like uh, a fist fight to me yeah felt like <laughs> it too yeah so he uh he's just a tough kid to wrestle uh he wrestles really hard but um, luckily some see I'm not any good at wrestling but I feel like if I was I would wrestle like him I would just be a meathead and just try to club you to death yeah that, that would that would be me if I was any good Hitler yeah I mean that's he, he's <laughs> very good at underhooks and, and just yeah he, he everything he does felt like he was throwing a punch at you um which didn't feel great so that was a, that was a tough match in but, the quarters yeah ended up uh pulling that out some experience came in in handy there and I felt like I was in uh, a lot better shape too so my my shape felt very good I felt like I could wrestle really hard stay in it for all six minutes um, and then semis Nate Jackson who's you know very good actually you know he's ranked number one he was ranked number one in the world the UWW point uh, point ranking system yeah, so, I saw that. And how did that happen? Did he have a big win overseas, or how did he get that ranking? So he uh, he just competed a lot overseas, and so, so it was kind of like a cumulative thing of you placed at X amount of tournaments and he accumulated enough points or whatever. Yeah, so he had just had more points um, than most people at ninety two kilos. I think he wrestled at Pan Am's at ninety two. He placed, uh, he took bronze in Poland, and then a few more tournaments before that. So he was actually ranked first in the world. Yeah. Um, but jammed my neck pretty good in that match about almost at the end of the first period. Um, so that was pretty scary. I remember thinking I broke my neck. <laughs> um, so that <laughs> that was not a, a fun feeling because um, a, a lot of thoughts go through your mind right. when you're laying on the mat. Like I legit thought I broke my neck. I was like, I don't know what's going on. But um, luckily, got it to, like, loosen up a little bit. And, uh, like I said, my conditioning was just kind of there. And he kind of died off at the end of the match and ended up, you know, coming back and winning by six, I think, something like that. Um, so that was, that was good to just tough one out. Um, it definitely helps your confidence in, like, Cause you train really hard all the time. And for like that to me was just the thing of like, okay, it's the training was like worth it. You know, it paid off. 
All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of intercede here and talk to you about my perspective of it. You know, as being your strength coach, I'm watching. Now, I don't know if you've really talked about this, you know, publicly, but I knew that you were hurt going into the tournament. Yeah, you, know, you were a little bit banged up. Your shoulders been bothering. You've had some issues with your neck, and you know, so then when I seen you get hurt in the semis, number one, I didn't think you were gonna be able to finish that match. Uh, but then when you did, and you were able to kind of pull it out and get that win, even though you you were clearly hurt, I, I'm watching, thinking you know what, he shouldn't even wrestle in the finals. He should just default out. You know, that, yeah. that, that's what I was thinking. Now, I'm, I'm not as tough as you, and I'm not in the, in the situation, but I'm watching thinking, and knowing that you were hurt leading up to it, I'm thinking, like, you know, you shouldn't even wrestle in the finals. Now, you got, you know, Jaden Cox, who's the best in the world. He's been the best in the world a couple years running. I believe that you can beat him, but to beat someone like that, you have to be at your best. Yeah. You know, and I, so how did you feel kind of knowing that? I'm just, cause I mean, obviously you go into every match believing that you can win. Yeah. But for you as a competitor, you have to know against someone like that, you need to be like on your game if you're going to, you know, pull, pull the upset, so to speak. How did you, what was your mindset kind of going out of the semis knowing that you got to wrestle a guy like Cox two out of three? Um, yeah, it was definitely, it was very interesting because I, I really couldn't turn my neck left at all couldn't turn my head to the left at all uh, but luckily like some usa wrestling trainers came to my hotel room that night and worked on it for like an hour and then uh they gave me some like muscle relaxers and stuff um they were all legal by the way yeah yeah it was all usa wrestling doctors um but uh i remember i forget who asked me i think it might have been logan or something in the next morning, they were like, so what do you think? Like, were you going to are you gonna wrestle? And I, like, the thought of not wrestling had not even. Hadn't even crossed your really mind. Really entered my mind. I was like, the, really not even thought about it. Um, and that kind of like, I don't know, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Because, I, I, yeah, it's, like I said, up to that point, I really hadn't thought about not wrestling. Like, So that, when he said to me, that, that to you, it was like really a shock. An yeah. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize like that was a, <laughs> that was like a thing. Like, I got to know, because I, I almost felt bad too, because I was like, I came back, I beat the guy in the semis. What am I going to do? Just not wrestle. And then like, I just crushed that dude's dream right? to just forfeit in the finals. Like, yeah, yeah, I, guess I at least got to wrestle, you know, like if I wasn't going to wrestle in the finals, I might as well just forfeited the match in the semis from my perspective because yeah. I would have been really mad if someone beat me and then didn't wrestle the next match especially the way you won to kind of at the last second yeah I mean the last maybe 10 20 seconds or whatever I think you got to take down and laced him up or gutted him I can't remember but yeah you know but it was definitely um yeah it, it I didn't feel great going out to the match just because in warm-ups I couldn't really do much um really just trying to like loosen up my body uh, just because you know j other than my neck you still have bumps and bruises all over the place you know because you wrestled a full day um the whole day before so really just trying to like get warm sweat but not really put my neck under too much distress and for someone like Jaden it's very hard to get to his legs um and score on him regardless but then I've been pretty nervous to shoot uh, leading up to the trials just because a lot of times, like it happened in the semis, I would get that stinger in my neck. So it was definitely difficult. But I will say in moments like that, the kind of adrenaline and like I think I do a pretty good job of, you know, clearing my mind. Like when you're out in the match, I, I never remember thinking about my neck in the match until it would get like hurt. And then obviously it was like, oh, this sucks. But well, I think that's something that's hard for a lot of people to do. Cause really at that point, once you're in it, if you are thinking about your neck, all it's going to do is inhibit your performance. Yeah. You know? So if you're able to kind of turn that off, I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why you're able to, you know, compete at a high level is because a lot of people cannot do that. Yeah. So I was just, um, you know, I go through my, my, mantras and my sayings before the match and stuff and I think that did a good job of 
you know, helping me clear my head. And then it really is, it's a, it's a very big moment. So you're just kind of, if you're thinking about a lot of stuff, you're not, you're not going to win the match. So I wasn't thinking about it too much in the match, honestly. Um, a couple spots where it got jammed again, um, definitely sucked, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, no, I think I still wrestled him well. But it's always – I came out with clear things to work on, which is always nice. Because a lot of times you wrestle somebody, even though I didn't score, a lot of times you just get dominated and it's like – you don't really have anything pinpointed on what went wrong. It was just like, he's just better. Mm -hmm. But I felt good in the fact that I came out right away after the match and knew what you need to improve on things that I was like, okay, this is what I need. So one is obviously finishing on Jaden. He's very, very good defensively. And then two is, uh, defense. So always, defensive um more more so in the in the hand fight i know anytime i reached up with my right arm um too much that's how he scored on me both matches and that's how i got scored on in poland too okay. so right after the match that's kind of the two things i was like told logan like that's this is what we need to work on I mean, it's some really good awareness to be able to write after the match to be able to talk to your coach and say, all right, here's the, the holes I've identified and here's what I need to to, to change and, you know, work, work towards for, for next time. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's obviously – it was very frustrating um, taking second at Olympic trials and then, you know, six months later, take the second at World Team Trials. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways to look at that. I mean – think of how many athletes would kill to be number two on the Olympic ladder and yeah. to be number two on the, you know, the world team ladder. So to be the clear number two guy at two weight classes in the USA is an incredible accomplishment that most wrestlers will never achieve, but being the bridesmaid or the maid of honor <laughs> back to back, yeah, you know, you want, you want to get that ring, you know? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a great thing, but it's also, I think something that can really motivate you as well. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna say. It just it leaves a it leaves a very bitter taste in my mouth. In that, I always um, default to what went wrong, like right away. So I think that that's that's always helped me a lot, having that kind of mindset of assessing instead of like pouting. Well, I'll like tell I you, I get mad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen you pout before too, though. It's it's yeah. usually not after a match. It's usually in the you know the practice room or the weight room. I've seen uh -huh. you pout a little bit. Yeah. You've gotten better about it the older you got. Uh -huh. But um, I've I've noticed you know I've known you for a long time. You know I've worked with you since you came to Ohio State as a red shirt. That might have been what six seven years ago. It's been a while now. Uh -huh. And you know something I knew right away. Even be, you know coming out of high school. You know I mean I knew who you were, but you weren't like the you know this. Uh, you know, super, superstar, five-star recruit guy that everyone in the world knew. But I knew who you were. But the thing that stood out to me the most was like, this kid is fucking tough. He's <laughs> competitive and he's tough. So let's, let's talk about toughness for a while. I think this is something I want to, on every episode, no matter who I have on it, I want to kind of talk and dive into a little bit about, you know, kind of toughness and where that comes from. The whole like nature versus nurture thing yeah all right you know i mean you know some people were they think they're born with it but was it were they shaped by their environment now you you come from a whole family of athletes let's talk about your family a little bit so your yeah. dad john moore legendary tough guy legendary w legendary i mean I, at least in my <laughs> mind he's he's legendary right well, he is and uh you know i i come from a you know my dad was like a legendary tough guy in our little area too so mm -hmm. it's almost like i think of him i think of john moore as like the kim myers of your your area. So yeah. t tell me a little bit about John and what he was like when you were a kid and kind of your perception of him, not just of a, of a dad, but as being an athlete and being tough and as a coach. Think about how, how you looked at him as a kid. Yeah, I just, anyone I ever talked to at a wrestling tournament um, that knew my dad, like the first thing they would say was just like, your dad, we were all scared of your dad in high school. Like your, your dad was the biggest badass in the world. <laughs> like you should have seen him like so it was just always these like tall tales about 
stuff my dad did in high school and how like strong and just badass he was. Well, and, and as a kid, I think any any young boy already thinks that their dad is Superman. Yeah. So like even the dads out there that are total pussies, their kids probably at one point think their dad's so tough. Yeah. But you have, just like I did when I was a kid, out of everyone telling me, telling you how tough your dad was and what a badass he was. Yeah. So I would say I wanted to always like, I always wanted to emulate that. I thought it was cool. Everyone thought my, everyone was scared of my dad and no one would mess with my dad. Like everyone just respected my dad so much. So obviously that was something that, that was a place that I wanted to get to in life. Um, I don't know how much I really like sat down and thought about it as a little kid. Well, as a kid, you don't it, really think about stuff like that. Yeah. It's just kind of like something you're maybe cognizant of, of like thinking like, I mean, I mean, even just, I remember thinking, well, my dad's a weightlifter. Like that's what I'm going to be. Like, I didn't really think of it in that way, but it was just something like I knew. Yeah. You know, but I, I remember my dad would take us to uh, Chanel practices growing up um, where he went to high school and you know, Jaggers and coach Ralph went there and, um, I remember just walking into the wrestling room and the high school practice would be getting done as the youth practice would start right after. And I just remember like there'd be like sweat, like condensed on the wall. It just looked like people were fighting in there for like an hour and a half. Like it was, it just, it kind of scared me a little bit as a kid, like walking (laughs) into this like war zone almost and then you're ready to practice. And the high school coaches would stay from high school and help coach the youth practice right after. So, and they were all my dad's high school coaches um, from when he was there too. So it was a really cool experience to be kind of influenced not only by my dad, but by the people that influenced my dad, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but my dad basically was always like he would just preach hard work and just like just fighting i don't know not like fist fighting um but just that attitude of like you don't give up a takedown in the room now he would never say it's not okay to give up a takedown like he would never be pissed that i gate like got taken down but, but it was not, always but getting taken down and giving up yeah. is two different things, right? Yeah. So it was always you never get you never get give up a takedown in the room. You fight till you know you you're just done. You can't fight anymore. And then the third thing that he I think he always said to me was if you're the toughest guy in the room, it's time to find a new room. Mm. So that was that was always the message. Um Cause you know, you get better and then you kind of progress and you start beating up on everybody in the room. And then I just remember we'd be like, okay, well let's, let's go to Wadsworth or something. Like, let's go to this room. And then, you know, you'd battle in there. And then I got good in high school and obviously (laughs) I think the toughest room in the country was Ohio state at the time. Um, and so when I went to Ohio state, he was just like, listen, you're going to get beat up. You just got to fight every day. You got to come in. You got to know you're going to lose. And you just got to keep shooting, keep getting, you know, keep fighting in positions, and you'll get better. And that's exactly what happened. So, <laughs> that's, it. that's exactly what happened. He predicted it. Yeah. So him and, yeah, him and my older brother. Obviously, yeah, so you, not only, you not only had the tough dad – the legendary badass John Moore, but you had an older brother too. Yeah. So let's talk about Kurt a little so bit. So Kurt, <laughs> Kurt. Was Kurt, it was, was he the older brother that like helped you by holding your hand and bringing you along, or was it, did, was he mean to you when you were little? Um, not, I don't, and I, I don't mean mean ever, like in a in a personal way. I just mean like was he beating up on you all the time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it was so much like physical outside of wrestling. Well, we would get in fights, and he would he would beat the crap out of me. Um, cause he was always, he's two years older than me for the most part. He was always bigger. That's my excuse, um, for why I lost all the fights, <laughs> but, uh, no, he just beat me at everything. I just remember him being better at me than everything I did. 
ping pong growing up everything it was the most frustrating thing in the entire world because i'm very competitive person but so do you you think that's where that competitive drive comes from is wanting to beat kurt or do you think you yeah probably yeah. i mean that that's definitely a big part of it i mean when you lose i mean basically i was losing it everything because i would hang out with my brother and most of the time i was hanging out with my brother and his older friends mm -hmm. so not only was i getting beat by my brother i was kind of getting embarrassed because i was losing in front of these older kids too that were there mm -hmm. and they were they weren't my brother so they would always kind of like poke fun at me um and then just stuff like that it was kind of like i think that's kind of like we were talking about nature versus nurture i think that's like the environment that i was kind of thrust in but i think it is kind of like what kind of person you are if you're competitive and you know you're you are a tough person then that can like thrust you into something good but maybe if you were born just kind of like with a as a softer person, yeah, that would have just kind of maybe turned you away from sports or, yeah. you know, you wouldn't really like hanging out with your brother because he picks on you or it mm -hmm. could be looked at in a totally different light as something detrimental yeah. as opposed to something that really, you know, shaped you into something great. Yeah. So I would try and win everything. I would try and beat my brother to a fault. I could do it. I would try everything I could. And it was probably bad at some times. You know, I was like, I would get pretty dirty <laughs> when we wrestled and stuff. Like I was just go, I would get so frustrated. I would, you know, I would go to extreme measures to beat them and I would still come up short. And it was, you know, just learning how to, to navigate losing like that. So this year at Thanksgiving, Kurt wants to play darts and he beats you at darts. What happens? Do you get pissed? Do you turn uh, it into a wrestling match? I mean, or is it just, you take the L? No, I've I've grown up <laughs> I've grown up a lot um uh, since since high school and stuff. Um but but he's, was, but he's still your older brother, you know, and yeah. you're going to be in that same dynamic. You're you're in the house that he put a million ass whoopings on you uh -huh. from the time you were born. Yeah. Isn't there a part of you that does not want to lose him still at anything? Yes. Yeah, I still obviously I I want to beat him obviously a lot. But I, you know, now it's like, I, it doesn't mean as much to me now as it did um, when I was little, I guess. Because now he's like my brother. I value like spending time with him more than than like beating beating him and stuff. Well, maybe now because you've you've surpassed him physically in some ways. When did you? When did you finally slay the dragon? When could you beat Kurt in a wrestling match? Because Kurt, <sighs> yeah. hey, even though he played soccer in college, was a great wrestler too. He won a state title, right? No. Or a state runner-up, maybe state he finalist. Was, he was uh, fifth and sixth. Fifth and so, sorry, I just made I just made that up. I knew my, he was good though. Yeah, my so my sophomore year, um, I made the finals. I had, we wrestled back to back in the semis on the same mat, so I beat the like the returning state champ in the semis. It was a big upset, and then Kurt was wrestling this kid from like Delta or something, maybe um, who had beaten before, and then he was winning pretty big. And then about maybe in second or third period, he like popped a rib out of place, mm. and you just keep, wrestling is impossible with right. with a hurt rib. Um, so he lost that match, and then medically forfeited to sixth so that kind of sucked it would have been cool to be in the finals with kurt but he was yeah he's very good um i don't know if i ever beat him in like a match or a go when he was in high school i think he had to go to, to, to college for a year and play soccer and then come back over like winter break or something and then i could beat him but and do you remember like a feeling of that first time when you beat him? Do you remember kind of feeling like there was a like a changing of the guard almost like now the relationship was going to be different in some ways? Yeah, I do. Um, at least for me. But Kurt, he he would play. He's very he was a lot smarter than me, too. So 
when he came back, he does a good job of like he can lose and kind of like not care and kind of make it he would always make it seem anytime I did beat him at something, he would make it seem like it wasn't a big deal to him. Which was frustrating. And then put for it on, me. and then put it on you like you're the one making it into a big deal. Yeah. He's like, Well, yeah, I don't really he's like, Oh, I don't wrestle anymore. So like it's like, oh, I'm good like for you. can you just be upset? Like <laughs> like I was for ten like for fifteen years, can you be upset? That really takes the sweetness out of the victory, don't it? Yeah, it does. So like that you, want was, the, you want them to feel the disappointment. Yeah, it's frustrating. He would play so not only was he better than me a lot physically, he was he was always always two years old. He was a lot smarter than me most of the time too. So he would always you know, anytime I would beat him after that, it was just, just like oh whatever. I was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, man, like I'm trying to get excited. Like right. I'm I'm happy and he's just like yeah, whatever. And it, I wanted him to You wanted him to care the way that you used to care and it yeah. just it, the reality is he doesn't care and he also knows how much you care so he's not going to show it to you exactly yeah he is smart i want to have him out here to have you guys do a bench off you know that's that's why i, I want to see you guys compete in my world and see because i know he's a good bench presser too and he loves the uh, bench. yeah i'd destroy him i think <laughs> i'd destroy him kurt if you're watching if you're listening he's laid down the gauntlet he'll destroy you not just he'll beat you he said he'll destroy you destroy you i'll break you all right so would you say then that was he maybe your your biggest influence on your your style of wrestling, or was it your dad? Was it someone at Chanel? Like mm. who do you, or was it Travell? You know who had the biggest influence on you? Look, not you know not you then, but now as more of a finished product as a wrestler, who had the biggest influence on your style? Um, probably Travell. I mean, when I got to Ohio State, I did not have a lot of technique i would say I, <laughs> I would hit like barrel rolls and i would take a lot of bad shots so i was just a little bit better than most people i wrestled i mean i, I wasn't bad but like i watched some of my matches from my senior year of high school in freshman year of college and i'm like this is terrible i think you you were more just relentless with your shot yeah which I think a lot of people had a hard time dealing with. They're used to someone shooting maybe twice a period or whatever. You would come out and shoot a dozen times yeah. easily in one period. Because I watch some high school kids now that are like, at who's number one? And or some kids that come in, you know, their freshman year and win nationals. And I just naturally kind of compare myself at that point in time to them. And I'm like, well, that were, they were way ahead of me. But I think once Travell got into more of a coaching role and helped me out, just fine tune a lot of things, um, really, really changed my wrestling. Yeah, Travell, Travell helped me out a lot. Shout out to Big T Money. Yeah, Big T. Well, who do you think had the biggest? If you had to look back, you know, going back to a kid, like your mindset, we, I guess we've kind of already talked about this, but this was a question I wanted to ask you because I've always wondered who had probably the biggest impact on your, on your mindset as a competitor, as a wrestler, and as an athlete? Um, I'd probably say I would still say my dad um, just because I think the most important thing that I've – I've learned, well, the mo most important thing that helps my wrestling is just that toughness factor of just, like, fighting people, you know, every day come in and just, like, just fight every position. I think my dad kind of instilled that in me in a, at a very young age, and that's what's probably helped me the most. And Travell's helped me, and in, in, in Tom and Jay, they've all helped me a lot mentally um, just figure out you know, like just the high stakes stuff, you know, winning and losing and big tournaments and because they've all been there and stuff. But I think that stuff is very like, um, like fine print things that can make a difference. But like, but if you don't have the base structure yeah. down, it, that stuff isn't going to matter. Yeah. If I didn't have that like toughness or just like the hard work aspect that my dad, you know, helped me out with growing up 
and and really a lot still to this day. Um, yeah, I, I definitely would not be as good as I am. Well, I think just even just that thing that you said your dad would say about, you know, never give up a takedown the room. I mean, it sounds like something so obvious. Obviously, you're going to get taken down. Yeah. But fight for through every position and never give up a takedown. I mean, that's something I'm going to use with Jack. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to him about, you know, because I'm now I'm kind of in I'm in this position where, you know, Jackson, maybe his second year of wrestling now he's going to club. Clay Reeves is working with him. You know, I'm going to be coaching his team this year, his actual team here in Granville. And yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped about it. And I, and I feel like he's making good strides. Yeah. You know, Jack, me and him, we've worked out together. He's a very hardworking kid. But I picture like the type of kid he is at nine years old, very different from Colin Moore at nine years old. You know what I mean? Well, first of all, he's nice. Yeah. He's very smart. You know? <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> he's not a meathead yet. But no, I mean, the kids are different, you know? Yeah. He's, he's more similar to how I was at that age. Like, he's not a naturally hard-nosed kid. Now, like my, um, you know, my sister-in-law's kids, so my, his little cousins, they're like little roughnecks. You know what I mean? They're like always pushing each other off the chair so they fall and hit their head. And, yeah. You know what I mean? They'll, they'll spit in your face and try to kick you in the nuts, you know? They're, they're just that type of kids, and they, it's just, you know, they're just uh -huh. wired different than Jack. Now, luckily, Jack knows how to wrestle, so he beats up on them. But, yeah. but so he, he's not that type of kid. He's naturally a softer, sensitive kid. So how do I take my kid, who's like I was, you know, you know, not a naturally rough kid, and how do I make him tough and rough but do it in a way without – I don't want to be that dad that tries to, you know, take my kid and make him into something he's not. Yeah. I want to be able to kind of show him the way and help him – and challenge him, but not in a way that kind of creates a rift between him and I, and, and not in a way that tries to to change who he is as a core person. It's mm -hmm. tough. It's a it's a tough balance. Yeah, you know. So I think that's something I'm going to stress to him is like, you know, it's okay to get, it's okay to lose, it's okay to get taken down, but you can't ever give up in a position. You can't ever give up a takedown. Yeah. If you lose the position, oh well, right. And I think something that I wish. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people told me, but growing up, I think it's important to like, like flip a switch when you walk into like something you're competing at. Like when you walk into practice, you flip a switch to like, okay, I'm not like I'm in competitive mode now. And then, so I think for me, there was a time when I was little to where I was like, everything was a competition. Everything was like... Like turn it off at the dinner table. Like people wouldn't want to play games with me. <laughs> like my, to this day, it's always like the running joke. Like people, like my family would not want to play board games with me or like stuff like that. Because yeah, yeah. I would, I wanted to win and I would like, I would get really frustrated if I lost. It would and, ruin the night for everyone. Yeah. If you lose a monopoly. So I wish I would have done a better job at like to flipping a switch. So like you walk in, you're or even if you know you walk into your job, it's like, okay, it's time to get down to business. You you leave, flip the switch off, you're back to nice, caring, loving person. <laughs> but got a lot better at that one. But so yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. But yeah, just knowing like when you walk into the practice room, you're a different person. So what what other advice would you have for, you know, dads like me? There are guys that are in a similar situation. They got a young kid who they're bringing into wrestling, you know, and maybe, you know, whether they were someone like you, a very decorated wrestler, or someone like me that only wrestled a few years. I don't have this. Because I, I guess, let me, let me explain. I, I think a problem I see with a lot of dads is they want to live through their kid. You know, do I want my kid to be a great yeah. wrestler? Well, of course, but I don't want it because I didn't have it. You know, what I mean, it's not one of those things where I feel like I have to prove something by making my kid a champion because I wasn't a state champion. Yeah, you know what I mean, like I, I'm not worried about that. So, what what do you think? You know, coming from the you're not a dad yet, but coming from an well, if you count a puppy, you got a puppy, right? Yeah, I'm a dog dad. You're a dog dad. So, <laughs> but dogs don't wrestle, so we <laughs> we can't use that. But coming from the aspect of you know someone who grew up with a dad who was a great wrestler, came from a great wrestling tradition. You had the older brother who was a good wrestler. What advice would you give, you know, dads like me that are young in the game to make sure they don't ruin their kid? Yeah, I would just say make it about the effort. And I think that's something my dad always 
did very well was I get yelled at a lot growing up, but it was always about um, my effort in the practice. Like, did you try hard or, or did you not? I was, like, being lazy at home. Like, I wasn't cleaning up after myself. Like, I never got yelled at for not finishing the single leg or, you know, getting beat. It was always, like, you did, you did not look like you were trying out there or you just kind of fell over there or, you, you know, just little, like, just lapses in, like, laziness. I get yelled at a lot for laziness. And I, I think that... Well, that, surpri- <laughs> that surprises me. Yeah, well, yeah. no, not like... I wasn't a very lazy kid, but any time I was lazy, I got yelled at. They didn't let it slide. Yeah. yeah. Like, even at home, just... If you were sitting around at home for too long, it was like, why don't you go do something? Like, why don't you go outside or do something? Or why don't you clean up this? Um, but yeah, I think that was always the big thing. I would always get so surprised when my mom would yell at me though, like after like a soccer tournament or it would especially upset me in wrestling when she would be like, you just did not look like you were trying very hard at all. Well, that would sting and my coming mom, from Julie Coming Moore. from my mom, that was just like, I'd really like take a second and like think back like man, I felt like I was, felt like I was trying, like, my mom, <laughs> like what the heck, mom? Um, Isn't it weird how, di- you know, people's words affect you differently depending on the relationship and that, that you know, she, you weren't used to your mom yelling at you, you yeah. know? And that just reminded me of when I was a kid or I was in like maybe junior high. I remember being at a, uh, it was either a track meet or a football game and I was freezing. It was cold out. It was late. And my aunt back, my mom's sister was there, who I, you know, I, I love my aunt back dearly. And I was just like, oh, I was shivering. I was like, oh, aunt back, I'm so cold. And she just looked at me and just deadpan said, men don't shiver. <laughs> and I remember just thinking like, I'm never going to shiver again. <laughs> to this day, shiver. I'll never complain about being cold because I felt like oh, I could hear so the funny. disappointment in her voice. And mm-hmm. I'd never heard anything like that from my aunt back before. Yeah. It was like, why is she... Why did she just make me feel this small, you know? Yeah. So, so. especially sting when my mom would get on me for uh, my effort. And that would always be kind of kicking the ass. Um, but I, I would always remember my dad still, we broke down technique a lot. But mm-hmm. it was always, um, that part was always very constructive. Uh, you know, we would, my mom would um, sometimes fill my matches. She mm-hmm. was a bad habit of moving the camera screaming around, screaming <laughs> and holding the camera this way. And that was always a big thing, too. Um, but we would watch my matches all the time after youth tournaments and stuff. But it was never like uh, I would get excited to watch my matches and like break them down with my dad. I would not get so excited if, uh, you know, for some rides home when I just knew I had like a bad practice. Like I just was not in it that day. I knew I was going to get talked to the whole way home. See, I, I got some good advice from someone the other day. Uh, cause, Cause I hear so many guys talk about the ride home. Yeah. The ride home from practice, the ride home for the match. I, I can't even remember who gave me this, but they said, cause we were talking about, you know, I'm going to be coaching Jack this year. They said, don't talk about anything on the car ride, the car ride home. They said, you know, whether it's coming from the match, come from the practice, talk about anything except for wrestling. And yeah. then you can talk about it later or whatever, but they're like, say, don't talk about it on the car ride. What do you think about that? Um, do you feel like it was helpful or was it something you dreaded? I think, I don't know. I, looking back on it, I didn't mind it because it was like, I was going to be in the car with him anyways. Like, and we just got it out of the way. So it was like, it wasn't always like a lecture, like, cause it was like almost an hour car drive back from Chanel Mm -hmm. to a lot of the times. So it was never like an hour of just getting yelled at by my dad. But I think it was always good to just, I don't know. You, you knew you, when you had a bad practice and even when you didn't, it was like, it was always a good reminder to be like, you know, you did not look like you were trying very hard. (laughs) And it for me, I would have rather had it right then than, uh, you know, 
car ride, you're back, you're eating dinner, you're in a good mood again, and then you get talked to about practice that was three hours ago, and now you're back in it. Like I guess that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So I get that. I mean, it's – I'm not saying that's the well, I mean, approach that works for everyone, but I think – for me, that's that makes the most sense. Like, just get it out of the way, and then the rest of the night, act like it's not a big deal. Like, just move on from it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess I can see both sides of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, maybe comes back to the type of kid. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, with you already being this maniac, competitive, little roughneck, maybe it worked good for you. You know. Yeah. Maybe if I maybe if I kind of yell Jack the whole car ride home, he's gonna cry, and then <laughs> he'll go up to his room and won't want to eat dinner or something. So I'll, I'll have to be careful with that one. But it's definitely good good food for thought, and I always like to hear you know yeah. the different perspectives. Um, now, kind of changing gears here a little bit. You know, with this being the Wrestling Strength Podcast, of course we're talking about wrestling, and of course we got to talk about strength training at some point, which we'll get to. But that's not all I want to talk about. Every time I have someone on, I want to talk about you know maybe some other aspect of their life, you know? So what I want to talk about with you is something I know that you and I have in common and that's music. Now, if you're listening, you're probably thinking, okay, every, well, everyone likes music, you know? Well, of course everyone likes music, Yeah. but I think that, you know, you and I have been to a few concerts together. I know that music's a big part of your life and that, you know, you like to play guitar. You're always going to shows. I love to go to concerts. There's just like, something to it more than just going to see a band I like or hear songs that I like. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately because the summer's almost over. And like, so, like I like going to concerts in the summer. I like to be outside and, yeah. you know, I don't go to as many concerts in the winter. So I've been kind of reflecting on, you know, going out to Red Rocks this summer and, you know, going up to Nelson's Ledges, some of these other shows I went to. And I think that maybe part of the appeal for me is that kind of group consciousness that you have that's similar like when you go – to a Buckeye football game, or you go to the Big Tens to watch the Buckeyes, where like you're not just watching the event, but you kind of feel this connection with the other people there. The difference being at a concert, you're all yeah. cheering for the same team, mm -hmm. you know. So let, let, let's talk about you know concerts a little bit. Maybe if it, is this a release from you f or for you from you know sports and training and everything else, or why is it such a big big deal to you? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I think m music is just. Um always been like something I've been like really attracted to. And I think it, it goes back to the car ride a lot, <laughs> you know, like I, I learned a lot of music cause we would drive in the car so much to, you know, practice or competitions and stuff like that. And then when me and my brother got older and, you know, we could, like iTunes was a thing and you could go and find new music outside of the radio a lot easier than like going to like record stores and stuff. Cause what about Napster? Are you old enough to remember Napster? I was not on Napster. I remember LimeWire. Yeah. Yeah. Same I thing. Yelled Same at thing. a lot for LimeWire. Oh yeah. Ruined your computers. Computer. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I think that it, it brought me and my brother together um a lot we were always finding new music and stuff but i think i remember the first time i went to a concert was i was telling you this earlier it was the black keys and cage the elephant and i've never been like more excited for anything in my life i was like finally get to see these guys and like you said just the energy everyone is in a good mood everyone's so excited to be there um it, it's so different than watching the video on YouTube or seeing yeah. it on your phone and just, or just hearing the song on the radio. You're just fully like immersed in it. They got the light show going on. And then I think one of the coolest things about like live music too, is you just get to every band at first I would get kind of disappointed if it sounded a little different than what was on my phone. <laughs> Like, oh, they sang, because I, I would always be singing, and if they sang it a little differently, mm -hmm. and I sounded off, or like it sounded weird from what I was expecting, I would get like a little upset, but I think the more I started to like play guitar or go to concerts, the more I appreciated them like putting a little spin on it every time I would go to see them. Well, the thing to think about too is when, 
when you hear the finished product on iTunes, the music could have been layered together. They didn't just yeah. play that song live right there. There's a lot of stuff that yeah. goes into that post-production. So when you hear it live, that really is the real version of it. Mm -hmm. That's really them playing the music that they wrote and more or less, you know, even if they change it a little bit, I mean, that's how it's intended to sound. Yeah. So, and they do, when people do covers of other songs, I go nuts. I love that. <laughs> I think it's like the coolest thing ever. I remember um, Zach Brown Band did a cover of Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm-hmm. And the guy did uh, the guitar solo on an electric violin. And I was like, my mind's blown. Like, right. I, I don't know. Like, um, So I'm kind of like a little nerdy about like the technical side of things too. Mm -hmm. Like I'll watch the guitar player and like try and figure out what chords they're playing and stuff like that or just like kind of figure out how they're making some of the sounds because it's just it's very very cool to just watch them because when i play guitar i have to be sitting down i have to be Total staring at it it's very frustrating and these guys are running around the stage playing it behind their head like jumping up and down and to me that's just like the coolest thing watching them do something I really struggle with, with complete ease and like, it's, it's very cool experience for see, me. See, I don't, you know, I, I've never really played the guitar. I played the drums a little bit growing up, but I don't really know enough about the technical side of music to appreciate that part of it. But what I do love is when you get to see a band play a cover because it's something that probably no one's heard before. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be available on iTunes or anything like that. And it makes you love that song, even though if it's a, not a song you love. Like I remember yeah. one of the first times I saw my guys Tropodelic play, they played a cover of Waterfalls by TLC. Yeah. Now <laughs> I would never say like, oh, I love Waterfalls by TLC, but they played it. We were like, this is fucking jamming awesome. They were jamming it, yeah. it you know? Uh -huh. You know, I was just, um, yeah, I mentioned Red Rocks. I was out there to see my guys slightly stupid. They played a cover of, um, they played that One Love song by U2. Yeah. Which is an awesome song, even though I guess I never really appreciated it that much uh -huh. until I really like, I'm at Red Rocks and I'm in the, the vibe and in the moment listening to the words of it and everything. And then they kind of played like a reggae version of PIMP by 50 Cent. So it's like these, it's like you get these unique performances that you're never going to see anywhere else. You only see it there in the moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, like a dumbass, I probably like storied 15 seconds of it. <laughs> like, and they, then after yeah. you do, I'm like, why did I even do that? Like, no uh -huh. one's going to watch that and like it. Or, you know, even if I go back and look at it, like it doesn't know justice or anything. No. So you need to just kind of be in the moment and enjoy it. Yeah, I've always struggled with that because I want I want to capture it on video to like remember it, but I'm always disappointed when I watch the video right. the next day because I'm like, it's just not you. You just end up missing the feeling of being well, at the concert. I read something, and I mean this might sound kind of obvious, but they did this study, and I think it kind it did reference concerts. It gave concerts one of the examples. But it said that phones are changing the way that our minds create memories. So, like, let's say I'm in a concert and they're playing this song and I get it out. I'm like, oh, I got a story this and I record it a little bit. The way my, the memory is processed in my head is I remember the act of recording, recording. it. Mm -hmm. I don't actually remember, you know, the sights and sounds and the smells yeah. of that moment don't get recorded. This, me going here, is what gets remembered and embedded in my brain. So That's we, depressing. It is kind of yeah. depressing because then you have like, it's not, it's quality of a memory. Yeah. There's the other little details that we all miss out on. So that, that, that is something I struggle with just in all aspects of life is trying to put my phone away more. Uh -huh. um, and I feel like I did a pretty good job at it at the concert this summer. I'd maybe get one or two clips just for a memento. Yeah. But I mean, you watch some people at these concerts or even at sporting events or anything there, they have their phones out the whole time. Yeah. It's and it's like, what are, you, what are you doing? You could have just watched it on, you could have watched it on someone else's story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, and one thing, um, I don't know if you're this guy too, but I went to one concert um, where I was like pretty far away from the band. Mm -hmm. And it was in an arena too. So I was like third level and everyone was kind of like sitting down and kind of just doing one of these mm -hmm. to the concert. And I I was like, well, this sucks. Like, yeah, you don't no feel no energy. No getting into it. Like... So any concert I go to now, I have to be like on the floor or like in the pit 
or something. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's just such a different experience. Like you feel the amp on your chest, like No, it's it's a huge part of it. I mean, look, I we were at the Granville Blues Fest a couple weeks ago. Taj Mahal's playing. He's like a blues legend. Uh-huh. I'm there with my kids, my dad, my wife. You know, my dad has permanent ringing in the ears. So he, <laughs> he has earplugs in. He's, and we're way far back. Yeah. We're so far back. You can hear the music, but you can't feel anything. Yeah. My kids now are at the age. They think I'm uncool in public. So they don't want to like walk around with me. <laughs> you know, right. And so like, I'm trying to get them to go up there with me. And I'm like, Mia, come on. We used to come to the Blues Fest when we would dance up in the front. She's like, I'm some of my friends might be here. They might see me. No, no lie. That's how she's acting. Oh no. Jack's just like, whatever. He wants to hang out with my dad. He don't want to go up there with me. So I'm asking my wife and she's like, no, it's too loud up there. I'm like, that's the point. It has to be too loud. So they, they don't get it. You know, Uh I think my dad used to get it, you know, but he has that thing, the tinnitus in his ears now. So he, he really can't, but so anyway, I had to kind of leave them. And for 20 minutes, I went up front. I just had to feel, you know, up there to vibe a little bit, but I had to feel the bass in my chest. Actually, Just one of my out. favorite lines ever in the Beastie Boys. How you like me now? Wait, no, that ain't it. I got to ask you how you like the feel of the bass in your face in the crowd. You know? Because it, it's, it's a feeling to it when yeah. you can feel the music when you're up front. I know up there, of course, there's some like old 60-year-old hippies dancing around and stuff. <laughs> and just you, you feel in the moment more. Yeah. It's crazy. You see some of the videos of like like DMX at Woodstock or just like famous like huge concerts where there's like tens and thousands of people like you can't see the end of the crowd right like that to me is got to be one of the coolest feelings like ever i've been to like one music festival kind of like that but it was on the beach um but yeah, that that's like it's just such a unique experience. No doubt. Well, now I want to go to a concert, so yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have to find one to go to before the before the weather turns. Yeah. All right. Um. You know, kind of before we sign off here, I think we we covered a lot of ground, but I I, I want to do this thing here at the end of each show. I'm gonna call it the quick hitters. Maybe I'll call it something else, but I'm gonna get have kind of some stock questions, real short ones, that I want to ask everyone that comes on. All right. Now, this first one, and I'll tell you why I'm asking it, is because it's such a generic question, generic train of thought, but almost every wrestling parent or coach that I talk to, they ask me some form of this. They'll say, like, what's the best exercise for wrestlers? Or what should wrestlers do to get stronger? You know, it's such kind of a generic thing. But it, I get what they're trying to say, and I, you know, I, and I have an answer that I tell them. But what do you think is – either the best exercise for wrestling or do you, what do you feel like, you know, in the weight room has helped you for wrestling more than any other exercise? Man, I hate to say it, but I think deadlift. Boom. I really do. Your heart (laughs) wants to say bench, but you know, that's not the answer, right? I want to say bench or curls or something, but I think deadlift and you asked me this earlier, I was kind of thinking about it. The more I look back, like there is, there has been kind of a correlation between my deadlift and me getting better at wrestling. When I came to Ohio State, I, I don't think like four hundred five was you, a lot. You weren't even at four hundred five. I still remember yeah. you were you were three sixty five when you reported. Yeah, which is you know it's not that's not a weak deadlift, but you know for for it to be a college 197 in the Big Ten, if you can only deadlift 365, you're going to have a hard time holding position and finishing shots on big, strong guys. Yeah, so that's what I think the biggest thing is, yeah, it works. Your low back and just that position of not only lifting stuff up, but just staying strong when people are pulling on your neck and your head. And it's it's such an important position to be strong in. Just being comfortable, being like bent over and lifting, um, and just that low back into your hamstring muscles is always engaged in a wrestling match the whole time. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go a step further and say it's gonna be impossible to feel strong as a wrestler and be weak on the deadlift. It's gonna be yeah. next to impossible. 
Yeah. You know, or at least to feel stronger than someone who is a very strong deadlifter. If you're, if you're weak at the deadlifter, you don't do it. Yeah. So that, so that's an excellent answer because that's the answer I always give when say, people say, <laughs> what's the most important exercise for wrestlers? I always say the deadlift. Now we might be cheating here a little bit because you are like my disciple in the weight room, but you know, you, you had the freedom to say anything else. And I, like I told yeah. you earlier, I said, Hey, you can say whatever you want. Just be prepared to defend. I wanted to say bench. I really did. But well, well, if we ask what's your favorite, then you could say bench. Yeah. It's bench. Bench press. I mean, who doesn't love a good bench press? Yeah. All right. Next quick hitter. What do you think is the one, and this could be either a workout or an exercise, but what do you think the coaches need to stop doing? High school coaches, college coaches, maniac dads that have a weight room and mat in their basement. What do they need to quit doing with their wrestlers? Um, that's tough. I think um, a lot of people like to go crazy on uh, like conditioning after a practice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the practice should just be really hard. There's a time for conditioning. So anytime we, we might do some conditioning after a practice, but it's never to the point of like, um, like it's not, it's never anything crazy. And most of the time we do our really hard conditioning. It's after like after a spar or after a drill or something. Yeah. It's a morning technique thing, but I've always been under the impression, like you shouldn't be able to. You should be able to sprint too long after a wrestling practice. Right. Because you just try to kill yourself in a wrestling. Like, I, I'm exhausted after a wrestling practice. Um, so, a lot I, of I times. I remember, not to cut you off, yeah. but I, I remember, you know, Jack's first year of wrestling. You know, there was one of the practices where they, they had a really hard practice. And this is youth. You know, I mean, at the time he's, I can't remember, he was six, seven years old. And then the coach had them running sprints after sprints after and finally you know jack's like having an asthma attack i said go sit on the wall i'm like this is stupid yeah you know i'm all for sprints i'm all for conditioning but they just wrestled like a bunch of live and now you're running sprints for 10 minutes like it made no sense to me yeah like there's a time to do that <laughs> and the, you know at this point you're just making the kids hate it oh yeah half the kids were crying mm -hmm. you know it's like what are we doing this for yeah so i'd say that and just uh i don't know that's that that was the one that just popped up in my head uh when you asked me before and what i've been thinking about yeah, um I, I had a, a kid that i work with his dad you know sent me a thing that he um that he did the other day you know he i'd sent him some track workouts to do you know some 400s and stuff he went he did the 400 he's like and then he lunged a quarter mile and then he ran two more miles and I said, yeah. that's three different workouts right there. Yeah. Like if you run the sprints hard enough, you don't need to do anything after that. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you, you know, you could maybe make an argument for, hey, I'm going to, you know, run, I'm going to, you know, run two miles after lunging a quarter mile. But in my mind, you know, just run the two mile. If you're, if you want to do you know, a hard baseline conditioning, run the two miles harder. Yeah. If you can still run two miles after the quarter mile, that two miles is not going to be very valuable to you. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know doing tough conditioning but being strategic about it is important i think i think you hit the nail on the head a lot of coaches don't have a handle on that they always think more is better more is better no pun intended there but um you, you have to be smart about it and you have to pick when to do that hard conditioning after practice yeah i guess there's always value in doing hard things but i think as much as possible there should be some sort of intention with right. with the hard thing so like you shouldn't just be, I don't know, you shouldn't be doing it too much to where you're just like doing hard stuff to do hard stuff. That doesn't make sense. Well, what happens is a lot of people take these, they do so much hard stuff that none of the hard stuff is done hard. Yeah. They're not putting a lot of effort into it. Yeah. Like you're not really running sprints now. You're just kind of like running a little bit faster than you normally would. So you're not getting mm -hmm. out of it what you should be getting out of it. Yeah. You and know? I like being explained what's like being benefit uh, like benefited i guess so like yeah any any athlete should be able to ask their coach whether it's their strength coach or wrestling coach and ask it the right way don't just say why are we doing this but say yeah. you know what's what what are we improving with this workout what what should i be focusing on to improve yeah am i trying to get faster am i trying to you know is my, am i just trying to build my endurance like what are we what are we doing here and sometimes it might be we're just doing it because it's going to suck and you need to get mentally tough. And that's okay every now and then, but it's not like 
it shouldn't be just a constant thing. You're just doing hard stuff all the time for like no reason. There should always be like a purpose behind most stuff you do. And I think a lot of times coaches just know that they're supposed to be like kids have to do hard things. So they just throw the kitchen sink at them and it's like they know running's okay, good. Well, so we need to run. Yeah. What was the point of that? Right. <laughs> like what did, they, what did they get out of that? And sometimes it is just like I said, sometimes it could be just we all right. They need to get a little mentally tougher. So like one one practice, it might just be we're just going to do it because it's hard. But most of the time it's they're you know, they need to they need more endurance in the hand fight. So we're going to hand fight after practice, stuff like that. All right. Last quick hitter. What is if you can narrow it down to one, what's one of your most favorite memories workout wise? What's like a favorite, whether it was something crazy you did or it was in a crazy location or the, the, the workout mm -hmm. partners or whatever? Give me one of your most memorable workouts. This could be wrestling based. It could be lifting. It could be anything. Huh. Um, I would say probably one of the the most like interesting and like somewhat rewarding workouts I've done, and I know you just did it, is the incline at uh in Colorado Springs. Um. And I think we woke up, we were out at the training center. We woke up at like 3.30 in the morning because you, we try to get on it before the sun came up too much because it gets pretty hot. So just waking up with all the guys in the van, driving down. And then this is the first time I've done it too. I've heard all the stories. So I'm like. There's a lot of build up to it. Nervous. I'm like, this is going to suck really bad. But it's, you know, it's all the Ohio State guys. I think it was. Like me, Miles, uh, Kyle, Logan, Nato, uh, Kevin. And I think we were trying to get Joey to come to Ohio State at the time. So he came with us. Um, That's like a who's who of the last 10 years of Ohio State wrestling yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was just, yeah, I think that was just pretty cool. It's really hard. And when you get to the top, it's just the sun was rising. The scenery is unbelievable. And it's, it's just really cool. So I think. And it's extremely difficult. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It sucked. <laughs> yeah. I think all of my workouts that I think of like that, you know, that are very memorable to be memorable to me. They're usually in some place that's beautiful and they're also extremely difficult. So there's like yeah. this juxtaposition of, you know, extreme suffering and just immense natural beauty. And that's life, right? That's yeah. wrestling. Yeah. Dude, I don't think we can find a better place to stop there. <laughs> Colin, I appreciate you, man. So where anyone who's uh, who's listening, where should they find you? Where should they follow you? If you want to give a shout out to your sponsors, that type of thing. Boom. Go ahead. Yeah. So you can uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at more underscore of underscore Colin. So and then as always, big shout out. Max effort muscle. Um, use your stuff all the time max up for muscle.com get your stuff there uh rudis they have the best wrestling gear um out there i'm actually going there today to get the new running shoes look look amazing boom get your journeys. product placement right there <laughs> um yeah they just came out with the new like uh, the new alphas uh wrestling shoes look sweet going to get some of those and they're always coming up with something new we might be a little collaboration here soon. You may have heard the rumor here first. You know, we won't we won't disclose anything else than that. But love the guys at Rudis. Love it. actually, I got their socks on right now. And I told someone the other day because they were saying, "Man, all you ever wear is Max Effort Old School." I said, "Well, those are my brands. The only other brand that I'll wear is Rudis. Yeah, those are my guys. That's all you need. That's all you need. All right, Colin. Thanks again, man. Sweet. Thank you.